nice to see that we're filling out the room more and more. I like this. Uh, thank you everyone for coming here today. Uh, ESG is putting on a, a seminar. And today we have the pleasure of hosting uh, Asaf uh, Zobian. Dr. Zobian is the founder and president of Cambridge Energy Solutions. He is an electrical engineer with over 30 years of experience in power systems technology, economics, and planning. And prior to CES US, Dr. Zobian was vice president of uh, Tavor's Carmanis uh, and Associates, where he worked on more than 30 different generation and transmission assets, rights valuations with a total of more than $20 billion. Um, Dr. Zorbian has also done many other things, including uh, publishing in the IEEE Transactions on Power Systems, International Journal of Modeling and Simulation, uh, and transaction, IEEE Transactions on Industry Applications. He earned his MS and PhD right here at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and also has a BS and ME from the American University in Beirut. Today, Dr. Zobian will be discussing software technologies enabling green energy. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's great to be back here on campus after more than 20 years to see old friends and meet new people. Um, as you know, these are very interesting times for our industry. Uh, uh, we are basically facing uh, major challenges and uh, it's great to see the brightest and the smartest addressing and resolving um, the most uh, challenging problems facing humanity recently, specifically climate change and uh, energy and environment interaction. Uh, as you would guess, software is a, a major part of the solution. And I'll be happy today to kind of talk a little bit about um, this is just make sure this is working. Okay. I'm actually just going to minimize this so that it can actually this work. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you again. So I'll start by introducing our company, Cambridge Energy Solutions, give you a high level overview of our company. And then a little bit background, how we got here, how basically the role of um, renewable energy in meeting zero emission targets and uh, national and state policies on uh, climate. I'll talk about the need for software technologies to address these problems. And then specifically how to use software or how use software can be used to help improve the operation of electric power markets, the uh, uh, planning and development of the generation and transmission, new generation and transmission projects, as well as um, improving market transparency and efficiency. Uh, this is the abstract, you have seen it. I'll try to kind of go through it uh, step by step. Starting with Cambridge Energy Solutions. So we are a small software company in Cambridge here, Harvard Square. And we specialize in providing information for the participants in the electric power market. Uh, our staff are experts on the market structures in the US the operation of the electric power systems, as well as related information technology. And this, these kind of three pieces are very important for anyone who wants to uh, work with uh, and uh, help improving the electric power markets and electric power systems in the US. You need to have good understanding of the underlying economics of the markets, the market structure, market rules, the underlying technology of the electric power systems, and how they operate, and then the software technology to be able to solve and address all these problems together. Uh, our major product is Dazer, the head market analyzer. It's a tool that helps simulate how electric power markets and system uh, operate, function, and clear. As you know, most of the administered markets in the US are run by independent system operators. These are entities that manage the transmission grid, 
clear the electric pole market, publish market cleaning prices, and plan and help plan and develop the generation and transmission grids. So we try to emulate the process that these ISOs use to clear that they have markets using similar software. The electric engineering term for it is security constraint unit commitment. That's traditionally how it's evolved. It evolved from security constraint unit commitment to be now basically market cleaning option software. Uh, similarly, we have security constraint dispatch also that's used to clear the, the market in the short term in real time markets. So our focus is on developing software that emulate the operation of these markets and help market participants forecast market cleaning prices, understand how these markets clear, and then be able to run sensitivities and scenarios if they wanna expand the transmission system, expand the generation system, um, how, how that's gonna impact the market cleaning prices, the congestion pattern, where generation is needed to be built, where transmission is needed to be built, and kind of answer many, many questions, policy questions and technical questions, how we can meet the demand at the lowest cost, given all other constraints we have on the transmission and generation system. Another tool we have, Transer, Transmission System Analyzer. And that's more a power flow um, specific software that allows the user to focus on the details of the transmission grid, the electrical engineering of the transmission system. I'm sure you have studied power flows, you have solved power flows using iterative techniques, Newton Raphson and other iterative techniques. So this is, would be basically a way to take expected generation, expected demand, and then solve for power on the transmission system and identify where power is gonna be flowing, if there's any overloaded lines, and then use that for operation planning and then optimization of the expansion of the grid. Uh, we have many other tools, I'll come back to it as I related to the need for the software in the market, but this is kind of just wanted to introduce to you the company, the software we use and develop and um, some of our clients as well. So we have more than 100 clients uh, using our software and our client base covers the entire spectrum of the electric power market participants from financial traders to independent system operators. One of the largest ISOs in the US is using our software uh, to utilities, vertically integrated utilities who are trying to optimize the operation of their generation assets in uh, in the market and then um, develop hedging strategies for those assets. Investment banks who are doing again, pure financial trading, uh, large merchant generators, companies that own, develop, and own and operate only generation assets and participate in the wholesale markets. On the other side, entities that serve load, retail and wholesale load, and uh, need some price transparency to be able to uh, provide long-term um, uh, power purchase agreements and pricing for the long-term. And then of course, we have some uh, research universities and consulting firms using the software. Um, consulting firms, can use the software for various studies, cost benefit analysis of new generation or new transmission project, cost benefit analysis of certain public policy implementation, public policy change in the market, uh, mergers of certain entities or ISOs growing and adding more participants in the ISO. So it can be used, the software can be used basically to, to study any, any behavior or any expected change in the market um, or in the system. So let me start by uh, why these are interesting times for us. Um, just as a story uh, for you, when I first started my graduate studies, uh, I told a friend of mine that I want to do it. I want to do my research on electric power systems, and he told me it's boring. Everything is done to be done. There is already done. That was initially that power systems. Now it's basically you will see it's in, uh, with all the changes happening. I think we need all the resources, and as I said, the brightest and smartest people to be able to help us address the problems that are facing us as a humanity and resolve them. So starting with US climate public policy, and I just hear highlights from one of the reports and public policy by uh, the office of the president. The idea here is we want to basically, as part of the Paris Agreement and part of our objective, is to reduce the net greenhouse gas emissions 50 to 52% by 2030, 
and um, then by 2050 have net zero emissions. And along this way, we wanted to make sure that basically we have 100% clean electricity by 2035. So that's the first target. Once we have a clean um, electric power system, then we move to the transportation sector, which is the, actually the first major source of emissions in the US. And that will be basically moving to electric vehicles and uh, electrifying the transportation sector. And then after that, residential, commercial, and then heavy industries. So that's the plan. This is the objective, this is the target, and th th that we are working towards that. This is more kind of uh, another way to uh, see it on a graph, historically where we were. You have seen that basically, uh, this is specific to CO2 emissions that we have been increasing since 1990 to around 2010, then in decreasing, and then we expect it to uh, decrease furthermore, much, much stronger slope decrease between uh, 2025 to 2030 to reach that target. And then after that to 2050 to reach net zero emissions. Of course, we're talking about greenhouse gases. Oh, there are ethane, there is CO2. This is the focus here on CO2. Um, how to achieve this, still the plan, the plan is to achieve this by 2020 or no later than 2050 by having federal leadership on the federal level innovation, that's an important part of this plan, non-federal leadership, state um, participation, and then all of society action. So, but also it's not just a US problem. This is a worldwide problem, as I said, facing the humanity. And then if you look at it, US currently emits 11% of the annual global greenhouse um, gases, compared to China, which is 27%. So you really need to have to solve this problem on, um, on a, on a worldwide scale rather than just the US, but we are an important piece of it. Um, now the implementation. So that was the plan. And then the implementation, the implementation of the federal policy through basically a law uh, and the uh, Inflation Reduction Act that came into law in August, 2022, just recently. And the idea here is basically, we wanna invest as much as possible money in the renewable energy sector it, through different mechanism to help us advance and reach this goal of basically net zero emission in the electric power sector by 2035. So the first number here to see is like basically around $369 billion in renewable energy. Just to give you an idea how much that translates, this translates to roughly 400,000 megawatt of solar generation. This is how much it costs to build 400,000 megawatts. That's roughly half of the generation capacity in the US. Like in the, in the US, maybe there is one terawatt of generation capacity. This is what we are, uh, the plan. Even if we can build 40,000 megawatt of solar every year, this is gonna take us, take us at least 10 years to get there. So that's not going four, so that's, that's the plan. We need to build every year 40,000 megawatts roughly of renewable energy to get there. And that's, that's, if we say solar, of course, we have to build solar, wind, storage, and many more. Um, the, the, the idea is this is going to provide basically savings for consumers, but also is going to induce economic activity, is uh, create jobs, clean jobs, and then drive major part of the economy toward the green energy, and then export that capabilities to outside the country. There are many mechanisms to achieve this. The most and most important and the biggest one is tax credit. This is more like production tax credit associated. Usually it's either investment tax credit or production tax credit. But the idea is you give these a new projects this tax credit and um, uh, subsidize the cost of operating and building these new projects. Um, there are uh, there are many uh, aspects of it. Uh, it, it. Also, it's not just to renewable as in the sense of wind, solar, but also to clean energy. There are tax credits and benefits to clean energy like nuclear energy and any other source of clean energy. Uh, <clears throat> this is more here kind of just to give you an idea. That's basically the production and investment tax credit, zero emission nuclear power production credit. And then there are um, additional funding for greenhouse gas reduction fund, uh, fund and innovative or innovative green energy projects. Um, so that's on the federal level, but also we have many, many programs on the state level, also kind of 
driving towards clean energy and either through renewable portfolio standards where there are requirements to, um, to build certain amount of renewable sources or to meet certain portion of the demand that state from renewable sources or direct targets, net zero emission targets by certain times as well. These are driven by the states themselves. So many, many states have these programs. Also, there are many regional programs like this uh, regional greenhouse gas initiative, which is most of the Northeast where we have a cap and trade program. That's another kind of example of economic um, uh, textbook of implementing a cap and trade program uh, uh, to help uh, first internalize the cost of CO2 into the product, which is electricity, and second, um, induce or help the market participants invest more in cleaner technology by making the more the kind of emission-based technology more expensive. And then eventually can use some of that resources also to for energy efficiency program. So revenues from the program is used, reinvested in energy efficiency programs and other programs that reduce energy use and effectively emissions. So we have the regional uh, 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 gas program in the Northeast. We have a similar program in California and then tied it to Ontario, uh, sorry, to Quebec. And then we have another program in Washington, Colorado, and so on. So many, many states have similar programs, but there are some CO2 trading programs. There have been in the past discussion of having CO2 trading program on a federal level. That didn't work. And really the real program now on federal level is the recent Inflation Reduction Act, which is more the tax credits and the benefits. Of course, the EPA regulations, there are some many regulations to limit emissions from electric power plants, none of them directly specific to the greenhouse gas as yet. So that's that's kind of really the driver. That's where we are, that there's a federal state policy and there's a strong push to build um, uh, renewable clean energy to reduce emissions. So now why we need software technologies? So as I said, the power system have been operating for more than a century. Why now? Um, first, that the traditional sources of dispatchable, dispatchable generation from fossil generation fuels being replaced by intermittent, important, intermittent, uncertain, uncontrollable renewables. So that's, that's a major change on the supply side. Um, that before a coal-fired power plant or natural gas-fired power plant, it's always available and then it's dispatchable. If the demand goes up, you increase generation from the units. If the demand goes down, you send a dispatch signal, it goes down. Now, basically, if the sun is up, if there's generation, if it's cloudy, um, basically, if there's eclipse, all that generation is gonna go down. It's uncontrollable and even it's not, it's forecastable, but it's not 100% certain. So that's one major change. The other thing is that even the demand side is changing and changing significantly as well, because when there's uh, demand is becoming more uh, variable, um, it's increasing. We have significant demand coming to meet um, the electrification of the economy, as well as the increased digitalization of the economy. Our economy is moving more toward, uh, toward AI-based data centers, crypto mines, all of these, each crypto mine or data center can use more than 500, some of them thousand megawatt, more than one full power plant. So there's significant increase in demand there. Also, we have challenges based from extreme, extreme weather events. Even if we didn't have the renewable sources that depend on weather, the, de the impact on the transmission grid on the generation is now function of the extreme weather events. We have seen something, Puerto Rico is a good example, Texas air cut market has significant extreme weather event that basically took major portion of the system for five days, we lost power, and it was amazing that they were able to recover even for five days. So we have these problems that we have now to have more resilient generation and transmission systems that can um, uh, withstand the increased um, severability and um, uh, uh, these extreme weather events and impact on the systems. And of course, still with the renewable, with the intermittent, still storage is the major, major uh, unknown. Still, we need a lot of research, a lot of development to help us develop long-term long -term storage technology. We have started to have short-term storage technologies, mainly batteries that can help us kind of solve the daily problem, daily fluctuation. Just we need to worry about the long-term fluctuation energy and how to manage that through storage. 
And again, as I said about, as the economy is moving more towards um, a uh, more digital economy, as the, we move the transportation sector more towards electric power, clean energy, that's gonna increase the demand on the system and that's gonna um, require more resources and upgrade in the infrastructure associated with that. So the scale is enormous. As I said, kind of, we have to basically uh, replace all the generation that we have been building for the past century and then build new generation to meet on top of that to meet the additional demand. Um, and all that has to be from clean energy sources, uh, efficient and mostly renewable, hopefully. Um, so that's on the supply and demand side, but also we have a lot of changes on the transmission grid itself. Historically, the attractive power transmission grid were planned and operated by centralized entities. They kind of built the generation and then said, we're gonna build transmission lines to move that power from that generation location to this demand center, we know the demand center. Now it's different world where basically electric power market participants are building that generation. Um, and then the system have to catch up with them or if they are visionary plan ahead by building enough transmission to uh, absorb the expected growth in new resources. But the question what to build, what kind of technology and uh, where to build or when to build is now outside of this centralized planning um, entities and it's more market-based market forces. Um, and again, basically the transmission system was built to move power from the additional resources to the demand center. Now that the uh, new sources of electric power generation is totally different. It's basically where it's windy or sunny. In the Northeast, basically, we have more and more focus on offshore wind. So this is totally new, basically, source where we're going to build uh, wind uh, farms in the sea and then bring that power somehow through some mechanism and integrate it with the existing transmission grid to be able to securely, reliably deliver it to the consumers and be able to meet the demand at all times. So it's totally different um, a requirement and totally different system needs um, on the transmission system as well. And then the nature of the generation is moving from what's inertia-based thermal generation where we have turbines running to more electronic or electronic-based resources, whether it's solar or wind, mostly solar, it's basically by in inverters. That's how you generate power through inverters, electronics, there is no inertia. So dynamic stability, voltage stability, all these kind of hardcore um, engineering studies of the transmission system are becoming more and more important, more and more needed, especially as we move more and more toward the higher level of uh, renewables on the system. And again, storage technology, storage technologies basically are brand new before historically were very expensive to build storage, energy storage, large scale. Now the cost is going down, they are becoming more and more uh, available, but still you need software tools to help you optimize the operation of these, integrate them into the market and properly price them to give them price signal to integrate and efficiently participate in the power market. Uh, also, we, 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 we need kind of, uh, transmission enhancing technologies. So even taking the transmission grid as is now without adding new transmission lines and transformers, how we can maximize the utilization of the existing grid by basically using more dynamic temperature-based ratings rather than the static ratings. Um, you can use more uh, phase angle regulators to have controls of the power flows, move it from one pass to an alternative. Some tools to increase the impedance of one pass. There are tools that you can put on transmission lines, increase the impedance, and then kind of again switch power flow from one pass to another, um, or many other power flow control devices. Um, and then that's another important piece, also part of the software that this system now it's all basically depends on continuous monitoring and control. You have to continuous, for this to work properly, you have to have continuous measurement of everything happening on the system, every single generation, um, every single demand and power flows in real time. And that's kind of expose the system to really cyber attacks or cyber risks that we might there. So that cyber security is important part of this whole process. And uh, that there's, that's another software need that we need to be um, uh, pay attention to. And then, so we got the supply and demand changes, we've got the grid changes, and of course, market changes. These markets are continuously changing. 
and adding new technologies uh, kind of put uh, uh, put more uh, requirements on to change the software to be able to adapt and accommodate these new technologies and then send the right price signals to reward these new technologies properly um, uh, and, and, and any additional services that come with it in the market. So we need to change the software for to handle new technologies and new services. Also, demand participation is very important part of it. So far, the demand participation, and that's important piece that uh, most of us as residential and small commercial don't see the real price signal. Uh, we are still paying basically fixed rate, uh, uh, monthly rate, independent of what's happening in the market. If we start seeing the price signal, we will start being able to respond better to it. If I'm having an electric vehicle in my garage mm -hmm. and I want to charge it, I want to charge it basically during the periods when the prices are the lowest. In order to do that, I need to be able to see a price signal, and then the software that I have for optimizing the charging of the battery should be able to optimize it so that knowing that this is what I expect the prices to be over the next few hours, and I'm going to decide the best hours to charge my batteries for my electric vehicles. All that needs to be done. It's not there yet. And that's a missing piece in the market. They refer to it some ISOs as market failure because the, the demand part is not really actively participating in the market and responding to the price signal. And uh, you are a kind of example, electric vehicles, but you have smart thermostats, you have um, thermal storage, all these need to see price signal to be able to respond to it, and you need software for all that. And also this is more a real problem that we will we are getting, but we will, it's gonna get worse as we have more renewables in the system. All these markets are based on economic theory that um, the market cleaning price should be uh, should clear at um, the marginal cost of production. That's the theory of location market cleaning price. All these renewable sources have zero to marginal cost. There is no fuel; it's just the sun or the wind. So the marginal cost is very small, just whatever the variable rate of maintenance cost. But then the production tax credit made the actual opportunity cost for these resources even negative. So as we have more and more of this, we're gonna end up with very low short-term prices, close to zero or negative. And without full demand participation, the market cleaning prices and the market in the short term might not give the right signal for long-term development and investment. Most of it now is driven by subsidies, by these tax credits, most of the development, but as we uh, get out of that phase and go back to real economics or basically need a good short-term price signal that reflect and justify um, the cost of building new resources. Um, and then there's more complexity. Some markets have energy and capacity markets, not just energy. And then the capacity value of these intermittent resources is become very, very difficult. I'm not sure how much you guys studied the ISOs, the markets in the US, but definitely there is energy and capacity markets and the capacity value, it really depends on the value of a generation assets being available when the system operator needed the most during scarcity hours or when it's needed the most. So that's, um, that's basically why we need software at high level. Now I thought it's interesting to give you some examples, real life examples of two current markets operating in the US, the California Independent System Operator in California and AirCut in Texas. Um, and then kind of take a look at some of this. Um, so let's look at the first graph here on the bottom left hand side. Just give you um, the demand in California ISO, the green line, and then the demand after um, all the solar in the system, the utility scale solar um, in the system. You can see actually in on this day, the net demand can go negative. So effectively, and first let's look at, take a look at the green line. This is the demand in California after all the residential and behind the meter solar is included. And in California, we have something like 7,000 megawatt of residential solar. So the green line already reflects the residential and behind the heat solar. And then you got the utility scale solar, which is on the wholesale market side, um, coming um, during solar hours and then during solar hours, um, 
effectively causing the net demand in the whole market to be negative. If you look at that, the first graph here on top, you can see that green line, that's the renewables, and that's, you can see it's up to 19,000 during solar hours. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, this one here, yes. thank you. So this is here, you can see where the renewables are. And again, this is the net, this is the demand in California after residential and commercial solar. And this is the demand after the utility scale. Now, what do you expect the prices to be during solar hours? Anyone, what do you expect the prices to be? Because we have so much solar, way beyond demand, what the prices will be? Sorry. So I'm... Yes. These are strategies. I don't think Rupa is here, but uh, it really depends on what are the rules on that run with. Yes. Elaborate on that. So assume I, I really think it's an important fact. So let's say I have 80% of solar. So prices will come down, right? But I don't quite have 100%. If you look in some other items, synthetic public data, it says, I have whatever, 40 gigawatts of solar or wind, and then I have 60 gigawatts of mass run units. Now, can you explain to us? I didn't know what the answer to this question, because if these mass run units fill the rest, then everything is zero, right? Because solar is cheap, yeah. but if you take it out of the stock. However, if, uh, if it's it depends on how you account for mass run units. You're going to get a different answer to that question. Can you allow me? Absolutely. Uh, yes. So here the prices. These and this is these are all actual figures from the California market for April 15. And here I'm showing the market clearing prices for two regions, the major two zones in California: NP15 North Pass 15 and SP15 South Pass 15. And in two markets, the day ahead and the real time. Just focusing on the south, where there's more solar in the south, sorry, uh, here. There's more solar in the south. You can see that, struggling with the pointer, that the price, the market cleaning prices during solar hours are minus $40. Um, well, it's a combination of a few things. One, um, in order for the ISO to have enough uh, generation, to meet the demand post solar hours in these early evening hours. Sometimes you have to have generation online and available. And this generation have to be at minimum generation level. So you commit a combined cycle power plant, but it has to be at minimum generation level. Effectively, it becomes must run during that hour. And that contribute part of it because now you have additional supply. And the only way to start exporting from California to avoid that problem if there is export capability. But what's also what's important here is that first, if I own a solar power plant and I have a production tax credit of $30, then I'm willing to keep running my solar power plant even if the price go be $20, minus 20. Because if minus 20 and I'm getting $25, tax credit, I'm still making $5. So this is the production tax credit by itself is giving incentives to generators to bid their production tax credit plus adjusted for taxes to close to be minus 30, minus $35. And then there's another complication in California. There is California renewable energy credit that also that these solar projects and new projects can get. And if they don't generate, they lose that. So now they are saying we are willing to stay online even if I pay the ISO minus, if I pay the ISO 50 or $60 because it's the production tax credit plus the human credit. So you can see here that these hours, um, basically the price is really negative. A lot of generation, all the solar, all that 17,000 megawatt that generating here renewable, all of them selling the ISO and paying the ISO $40, $50 for the ISO to take their energy. We say, oh, this is a great opportunity for storage because we build batteries and then we store the excess energy that we have during solar hours and then we discharge it during the evening hours. And that's what the California Public Utilities Commission and others have been pushing for it, but then um, pushing for it through regulation and 
by requiring um, load serving entities and utilities in California to procure batteries and that capacity to help address and resolve them some of this problem. Now, of course, this is tend to happen during light uh, demand seasons, spring and fall, uh, when it's not the peak demand, and also when the sun is the uh, uh, basically um, most productive, or the solar projects are most productive typically in the spring. But this is the problem that happens. This is real, and this is even um, we have it now today. We haven't reached the um, the target objective of 100% renewables. So that's one problem we have: that negative prices, which we need to have through uh, solve it through, um, could be solved by enough amount of storage. Another major important problem uh, you can see here uh, identified is the ramping problem. By the way, this this curve here, the price curve here, used to be called duck curve because it goes up, down. It looked like a duck with a head like a duck here, but now it's a cliff curve because it can sharply goes down and then sharply goes up. And then the, the technical technological problem here is this ramping problem here. Now we have to have generation that ramps basically around seventeen thousand megawatt in less than three hours. Historical a coal fire generation would be slow responding and you have to have enough capacity first. And you have to have 17,000 megawatts of generation that can ramp up that fast and be available. And that's that's a major problem. So California actually have a new product, they call it flexible ramping product and new servers are trying to procure to be able to do this. So this is this is this is all new, right? This is, I mean, this is this is the changes in the market, and this is California is one of the frontiers in terms of renewable energy. Yeah, you have a question? Oh yeah, I was actually going to ask about California's uh, ramp product. I know that I said also that is a similar thing. Why, Correct. Why? Why did it not think that like energy prices are a strong enough signal? I mean, aren't the prices calculated in some sort of interchangeable coupling already to yeah. signal that? Yeah. yeah, you would expect basically in a truly competitive market with um, uh, the price signal might convey a lot of information in dispatch, but for an ISO, who's really uh, main responsibility is reliability of the system. They wanna make sure there's actually the physical capacity available to meet that ramp before they reach that point. They don't wanna reach a point where they say, oh, we don't have that capacity, and then now the price is gonna go to thousand or whatever the price cap, and it's too late. So they, to operate the system reliable, they have to procure it first, make sure there's enough, and if there's not enough, commit resources to be able to deliver it. So it's really more like security and part of this reserve mechanisms that built into the system. We will talk about reserve mechanism. This, this the electric power systems have more reserve mechanism than any other system. I would say whether it's on the generation side, uh, generation reserves, operating reserves, or on the transmission side. Um, capacity benefit margin, transmission reserve margin, or the contingency concept. The secure operation of the electric power transmission system by itself is based on reserve because the contingency analysis, all this contingency based constraint in case something happens in the system, that's the kind of built in uh, security and reserves and system. This is just a Price map kind of showing the prices, and this is more more kind of extreme during solar hours. You can see prices in the south uh, in the negative range, minus 20, minus 30, but in the north, the prices are in the range of 40 plus 40 plus 50. So there is significant um, uh, dis disparity in prices between different regions, between different nodes. And of course, we say, well, the solution is to build more transmission, right? That's for for the solar hours, build more storage. For this, build more transmission. Uh, the, the problem is how we can build transmission at the least cost in an optimal fashion and make sure that it's, if it's brown or it's green field, new transmission projects are very difficult to permit and takes a long, long time to permit and to build. So you need tools to help you analyze that and then do the cost benefit analysis and see if it costs you billion to build transmission line, how much you're going to save a year. Are you going to save 10 million or 100 million? And based on that, you make the decision, and then how to implement it, how to build it is a different story. Uh, another example, the haircut system. Now, this is Texas haircut system, and I wanted to highlight a few things here. One is that uh, the uncertainty in terms of demand. We have time-varying demand, which is we have always had 
in power systems that, that demand various time, but also it's uncertain and the uncertainty is increasing. So you can see basically forecasting demand in here uh, for air cut. In some hours, the error demand could be a few thousand megawatt between day ahead and actual future. But what adds now more that now we have intermittent resources that we have to predict how much wind can generation and how much solar can generation. And again, you can see that there's error in forecasts in these two in terms of solar forecast versus actual wind forecast. And then now we have the combined wind and solar forecast. And in this case, now we are taking, talking about something like 25,000 megawatt of renewables this hour, which is more than half of the demand in Texas. And Texas is one of the fastest growing markets in terms of more and more capacity coming online. This is a, a heat map of the prices showing you in the Texas panhandle where we have significant amount of wind prices negative because the wind is generating there can't have enough or does not have enough export capability to export. And then we have some problems in the South of the state. Again, the solution to this, definitely we need more transmission. And as we have more and more generation, um, we have more and more transmission problems. Uh, I'm gonna go through software needs uh, quickly. Um, so we have software needs for different market participants or different segments of the market for ISOs. Uh, the needs are to operate the market more efficiently, more transparently, and then to adapt and properly price new technologies and services, as I said. For market participants, to be, we, there is a need to forecast market clearing prices to operate generation efficiently, for demand to, uh, to basically, special retail demand to receive the price signal, optimize the value of energy. The example I told you about charging electric vehicle. Similarly, when do I turn on my AC? Or if I have thermal storage, how I can manage and optimize this uh, thermal storage with respect to the market prices, uh, assuming that the market price signal reflect all the conditions in the market, as you would expect. But um, different parts of it do, just not one part. It's the energy plus all the ancillary services. For uh, investors to make the correct investment decision when, where to build generation and what transmission projects to invest in, minimize risk, and then to finance these new transmission and generation projects at all costs. So, yes. So, for market participants, so if they sell back and forth, longer term forecast, are they allowed to be more than the your cost? Ah. Uh, <laughs> uh, each ISO have a market monitor. The, yeah, the, the ISO has market monitor and they they can monitor these events. It depends how much market power they have or they don't have market oh, power. Okay. They, they have some measurement uh, uh, kind of techniques or um, tests if they pass this test or not. Uh, if if a generator can have local, local market power and by bidding up or group generators can impact the market cleaning price, then the market monitor can look at it and um, uh, review it and then see, understand first the justification for this bidding behavior. Is it a true fuel cost increase, unavailability of fuel or difficulty to get fuel? It does mechanism, but I would say these markets properly monitored and efficiently operated with that caveat. Sometimes you might have things like that, but um, Rare. No. They don't gain. Uh, the, the rules are there to, to discourage gain. And is there a technical reason for us you know, that we have? Is there a technical paper if we are to define market power in, in electricity markets? I've been asking everyone. All the offers, but nobody has one. Uh, this market rule, this market rule. Technical constraints, and then have I to just worry about building those gates? I think all that is 
But the thing is that that somehow needs to be compared with saying, okay, give all the contracts to the system operator, and they somehow have the well, zero cost, operating cost, and uh, there is going to be this first conference in June where we are going to present a comparison, even for this part of, of the app. And if you have idea of the system, we can show easily that they are the same. But the minute you start having these things that we are talking about, dump rates and startups at our cost and uncertainties in the, in the wind and all that, things get very easy. So that's why I'm not sure that. that I mean, you're out in the real world. Are people really talking about this or nobody wants to talk? Oh, I can tell you, uh, we can run our software that simulates the operation of the electric power market using our estimate of what the marginal costs and see how that clear compared to the market. And most of the time, the marginal cost based estimates get very close to the market clearing prices. So that gives us high confidence that market participants most of the time are offering at their expected marginal cost. But we can find also days. How does I analyze for startups and down costs? There are included additional charge and settlement or um, well, they are included part of the offer by the generators, and all of these can be audited. Um, if this generator can very with its startup cost and are very flexible, how can we compute the marginal cost? How who do we charge how much at the end? Oh, well, there's uplift, as you know, there's uplift in the market. So the uplift is basically is to pay for any additional uh, generation cost that's not fully recovered through the market cleaning price. And that uplift is justified. That is actually the ISO committed a unit and it's economic to commit, but the LMPs by themselves does not allow it to cover its all its costs, including startup costs. So the uplift is paid to the different generators to make them whole for the day. So basically the ISO is gonna guarantee you or him, Lauren, that on any given day, you will be paid at least what you offered. You won't be paid less than what you offered and what you bid into the market. And his uplift, daily uplift might get much more, you might get zero uplift because you are very flexible, you get some uplift. And then that total uplift is, as you said, socialized among the demand based on some megawatt hour mechanism, including the market or not, it becomes more complex. But yes, that, that, was, that was part of complexity of the problem. And that's actually what makes these power markets very interesting. They are very complex. And then pricing based on pure economic theory has some problems, uh, convexity on convexity, and basically whether it's um, the right price signal or not. Been, and I think that early on there was debate whether it should be basically pay everyone the market cleaning price or pay everyone a bid so that everyone tried to guess what the market cleaning price. There was a lot of papers, as you know, about that and early on. I think what we reached is reasonable market design. Um, now, now the challenge is really to how to price it for the renewable resources that have these negative opportunity costs and zero margin costs. Right. But is it fair to say that this socialized approach generates a cost? Anything that's not cost. The, the way I understand it is that uplift is paid differently to different generators, uh, but on the load. Uh, yeah, based on uh, whatever offer they give offer in the market to make them whole. The idea is to make generators at least whole, and then they can make money on top of that in the energy market. Oh, good. Well, <laughs> it's definitely a very interesting PhD topic. Um, Sorry, that's why we are curious. I'll be happy to talk more about it. And then some papers we can, I can share with you some papers and some studies on this. Um, there was an issue with fast starting resources where uh, basically they weren't properly priced. And I think FERC recently, two years ago, required that ISO allow for fast starting resources and um, include that cost in the uh, market cleaning prices. Before they were uh, starting a gas turbine, 
and sitting making that turbine sit at minimum generation, it becomes inflexible, doesn't allow it to set the market cleaning price. Now all that has to change so that it, in theory, the market cleaning price should be more reflective of the true marginal cost of production in the system. Uh, so software needs now for, again, now, but for the electric power transmission grid. So to identify transmission needs on that grid and upgrade those again in a least cost manner. And you can do this two ways. You can say, uh, like Texas did, we have this competitive renewable energy zone. So they said we have the Panhandle West and West Texas is a great source for wind and solar. So we're going to build transmission to allow for the development of 10,000 or 20,000 megawatts wind in advance before. They built the transmission, expecting generation to come, and that was very smart. And then now even we have more generation wind and solar than actually that, that this CRES projects and uh, transmission projects were there. Uh, or as I said, the offshore wind, now we, the plan was to have 30,000 megawatt of offshore wind in the Northeast. So again, to integrate that 30,000 megawatt of offshore wind in the Northeast and, to the, and move that power into the demand centers, you need to, especially like in New York City, which on, on the Northeast coast, where you got all these major cities, very difficult to build new transmission to integrate that is, is a major challenge. And that's something important. Uh, uh, and that's, you need a lot of transmission planning, smart planning, DC converters, AC, under sea cables, under river cables, all kinds of these complex operations to get it to work. Uh, state targets on renewables and renewable portfolio standards. Um, in my, so most of the transmission, major transmission projects, we call it multi-value projects, were built to handle these state requirements of adding more renewables and allow more renewables to integrate in the system. Uh, but again, you need to identify where to build and the least cost a solution to build and you need software tools, you need to have good understanding and good models of the transmission system and good models of the future system to be able to actually accommodate the future system and build for the future as, as you expect it to happen. Yeah, sorry about that, but okay. I, I would just like to uh, in some places, I would say yes, and other no. And that's why we talked about this um, transmission enhancement technologies, where you see if there are technologies that allow us to maximize the use of the grid as is now before we build new ones. In some places, uh, I would say in some locations, um, it's uh, they, they're good, like in, in the Midwest ISO, they still use static summer winter ratings. Also on April 15, the rating of a line changes from basically 500 to 200. Nothing changed except the date changed. Things like this, yes, we are not using the transmission system efficiently in some places. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, well, the, uh, the voltage optimization has been now mostly as a reliability aspect. So the ISO is clearing the market, making sure that the voltage constraints are met without any real price signal for those. As you remember, we did a lot of work on this, I think. Professor Hogan wanted to do complex pricing for both real and reactive power nodal prices. I, I think just markets are already very, very complex. It, the, what we have settled to now is reasonable. That is, um, th there's ancillary services for voltage support, but it has nothing to do with real operation. The real operation of the market, clear that they had market and real time markets for real power, but making sure that the system is secure, reliable for voltage from voltage perspective and voltage constraints. That is all the voltage constraints are met. And uh, I think Kaiso have some software that does that in real time that dispatch reactive power resources to make sure that the voltage is met in, in there that in time. Um, it's, it, so you have to have SVCs or static compensator or, or active sources on the system to help you, or at least now commit units, uh, reliability must run units out of merit order just to provide voltage support and reactive power support. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, electric power utilities need software to design and build new transmission projects. I mean, if you know where to build, you still need to design the lines and design substation, design, design the transmission line, what type of conductor, what type of um, towers, things like that. And then most importantly, now also to integrate all that with the distribution. 
as we have more increase in demand, especially electric vehicle, um, and that's going to put more weight on the distribution system. And now we need to integrate the distribution system with the uh, transmission system. For market participants on the transmission side, we have seen a lot of um, merchant transmission that either build AC or DC transmission projects. Uh, these are major transmission projects that have a plan from moving power from Western Oklahoma all the way to Illinois, basically, or something like that. The idea is to move um, the wind and solar from where it's dominant uh, uh, high intensity resources to where the demand centers are, whether it's Chicago, the Northeast and so on. Um, and also for new generation asset developers, identify substations, locations, where to build a new generation. That's very important because if I'm a developer, I want to find a substation where I can easily hook my generation with no interconnection cost. If there are a few substations and one of them, there's huge interconnection costs, I want to avoid it because that's become a problem to my project and increase the cost of my project. Um, that's... Now, so now it comes to our software days. I'm going to take less than five minutes because I want to leave room for questions and answers, and I'm late. Um, so our software is basically, as I said, is, is a tool to help emulate the operation of these electric power markets and a way to experiment what-if scenarios. What if I increase solar generation to 50%? What if I increase storage here? What if I put storage here in this location? Do I create transmission problem? What if I upgrade the transmission system? So it's a tool to help me simulate the operation of the market and then anything I want to study. And from that, I can do any kind of cost benefit analysis on it. I can make this investment decision. I can make operation decision. And also in the short term, I can use it to uh, uh, trade and which most of our clients right now use it to trade power, uh, identify opportunities to uh, buy financial transmission rights as hedges and then participate in the day ahead and real time markets or arbitrage between day ahead and real time. And arbitraging between day ahead and real time market can be very positive because it can drive the day ahead market to clear closer to the real time market and based on a market view, what might happen in the system and the market, not just what the ISO view in the system. So uh, the software is very helpful, very detailed. It has complete representation of the transmission and generation system. It's solving full security constraint unit commitment um, with all constraints, including the optimization of pump storage. So security constraint unit commitment, as you know, kind of has to be solved. Mixed integer programming, the storage make it nonlinear, the losses component make it nonlinear. So there are many, many nonlinear and complexities that are adding the problem. And then of course, the secure operation, the N minus one aspect of it, make it a very difficult problem because of the size. And that's really where the complexity comes up from the size of the problem that, let's say that we have a, the PGM system with five seven transmission lines. If you do this N minus one secure operation where the ISO is protecting every single element for the loss of any other single element in the system, it's 5,000 times 4,999, it's 25 million potential constraints on the system that the ISO has to make sure that they are met at all the time and no, uh, no power flows exceed their limits and so on. So once you solve this problem, it's it, it, the tool help us understand the causes of congestion, why there's congestion in the system. That when, when, you, when you plan the transmission system, everything is in service, you don't have congestion, it's planned Space to meet the demand at, um, at um, with no issues. The problem happens when you start have transmission outages, when you have generation unit outages, when you have unexpected uh, outages or demand on the system. So that's one that will help you understand the causes of transmission congestion. And then once you understand it, the impact of congestion on the market prices. And the market marginal um, pricing theory is very, very neat because it's linear. So you can say that basically, that node or prices at any node is energy plus congestion plus losses. And that the congestion component is just the um, summation of the uh, contribution from each binary constraint. Because the linearity, you can decompose the prices into components and see that contribution from each constraint to the price. And the tool is very helpful for 
They have versus real time trading, trading, understanding the price formation mechanism in these markets. Also, very helpful in financial transmission rights trading, hedging for basis hedging from source to a trading trading hub, or to participate in these financial transmission rights. These there are markets for these transmission rights administered by the ISOs and then cleared uh, cleared by the ISOs. Also, the tool is very helpful for long term analysis planning, whether it's a policy planning, you want to impact understand or analyze the impact of new CO2, uh, nationwide federal program uh, CO2, or if you want to take any market, see if there's change in uh, demand, supply. If you want to retire thermal units, replace it by all renewables, you can run the model and then analyze the power flows, the market cleaning prices, and then also quantify the impact of that change on different market segments. You can say the consumers might benefit from this because it's going to lower the price. Producers might benefit or might lose, which producers might win, which might lose, and then where the transmission bottlenecks would be so that I invest in transmission upgrades to help that. Uh, of course, if I'm a market participant, I'm looking at for a portfolio of a generation assets or asset, I can take this view to have a uh, quantify the value of my portfolio in the market for different scenarios under different conditions. So the tool is very, very helpful for a variety of things. Uh, for any kind of study you want to do that involves simulating the market and the system and the interaction between the market and the system. Um, I think I'm gonna just just many just small pieces. In order to have this tool and simulate the operation of the market, we have to forecast the demand. So that we have uh, tools that forecast demand on a granular basis. We have to forecast how the wind generation from each wind farm is expected to be. So we have tools based on whether to forecast wind generation. Same thing for solar or on a granular basis. We have to have expectation of the availability of generation units and then the estimation of the marginal cost of every generation unit. So there's a lot of information in the system. Uh, we have to collect a lot of information. We have to provide a lot of information. And then we have to clear all that in the system. I think I know what time scale we're talking about and how the, the sorry, about the low um forecast and uh, how do you form your prediction based on what yeah so uh the granularity here two 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 parts one is on time scale we have hourly granularity our demand forecast is hourly we don't forecast with an hour but also granular geographically so that we look at for example system as air cut it's all most of that most of Texas. So when I have a forecast, it's based on weather. So it's mostly based on whether weather is the major driver for the energy markets, whether it's natural gas, heating, cooling, electric power, or so on. And now it's becoming more important because of wind solar. Because weather forecasts, we use it to forecast the demand based on historical correlation mostly between demand and weather. Uh, we we have to adjust for expected growth in demand. Uh, the data centers and uh, crypto mines becoming more of a challenge because that's becoming more lump growth and coming faster than expected, especially in some parts of Texas, West Texas, where there's significant increase in demand. Um, so that granularity is geographic and locationally. That is, we have to identify now where we expect more grad data centers to come. And uh, we were looking at one data center that was 500 megawatt a few months ago, now 700 megawatt going to Southern. That by itself is causing a lot of transmission congestion in the system or expected transmission congestion. So it's, again, the granularity of identifying where the data center are, which substation, help us identify where the transmission congestion is expected to happen and uh, which lines or transformers we need to upgrade or pay attention to. Maybe I should start my question. Again, what's your uh, validating your prediction based on the weather? You're using signal from the weather and then you're predicting the load. And what are you like? What are the points? How, how where do you get those like? Uh, I guess aggregated data points of, of the load. Well, you know? oh, the ISOs publish all that information. Oh. It, you you have actual real time load after the fact so that you can learn on it. So you have the weather uh, and then the actual real time, and then you can learn on it. Um, it is uh, usually it depends on the market. It's not uh, it's zonal or regional. Yes. It's not more, but it's still. And then for us, we have we can look at other files, other data sources that help us identify what we call non-weather conforming demand and take it out. So we take the non-weather conforming demand out and then forecast the rest, the weather conforming based on weather and then add back 
the non-conforming demand with expectation of growth. Uh, well, in, in our software, we still have the latest forecast. We still, the latest forecast of demand is used. Uh, our day ahead. And in in oh in data we don't we don't have the fifteen minutes the ISOs in real time they have either fifteen or five minutes real time markets mostly five minutes time market they have their own actual forecast still for that which which is short term forecast and then after the fact they have the real time adjustment um, most most of them I don't know how fast they can generate the real time and correct it, but it could be either in real time, they have the meters and measurement and estimate of everything. And then they have meter billing quality meters after that, that give you the exact real time demand at each substation. So even with the meters, the information needs to come to the center, Yeah. There is delay. There is delay, yes, yeah, that is definitely. Good. Uh, actually, I think uh, I ran out of time, so I definitely will open that question for the uh, for more for more questions. So please let me know what.